inside the skull, where the pituitary gland sits inside your skull. So that's right on top of the sphenoid sinus. Now, the reason I mentioned this here today in reference to the sphenoid sinus is because that gland that sits right here inside your head is attached to the bottom of your brain. And it is the number two most important place in your body for controlling hormones. Okay, if I say hormones, where did your mind go? Hypothalamus. The hypothalamus, exactly. So the control of hormones, and you think homeostasis, right? If I'm gonna control homeostasis in the body, I'm gonna do it with the nervous system and <laughs> endocrine, right. This is the number two guy. The hypothalamus would be number one. And its control of this gland is number two. It's the interplay of those two. So this is a very tricky place surgically. If a person has a pituitary tumor, it can cause massive problems in their bodies. The overproduction of hormones or the underproduction of hormones can cause issues in every area of life. And so getting to one of these tumors surgically is really tricky. Um, you want to avoid the sphenoidal sinus when you do that. And most of the time, the surgeon will come up through uh, the top of the maxilla to get there, avoiding the sphenoid sinus to get into this location. Do any of you remember its name from lab? The little satellite structure the pituitary sits in. The hypophyseal fossa, yeah. Some books call it the cella tersica. Did y'all see that word on it? Mm -hmm. Yeah? Okay. So that's where your pituitary sits. And here's the sphenoid sinus. So highlight the sphenoid, show them the cella tersica, or the hypophyseal fossa right there. Really important place in skull anatomy. Now here's a shot of the frontal sinus right here. See this hole in the frontal bone? So very close to the nasal bone. Um, you can't see the maxillary sinus. Um, you'd have to cut through the vomer here to see the maxillary sinus on this side. And on this side, it's already been cut off. Um, and the ethmoid sinus is the same way. They're hidden here um, with the perpendicular plate. Okay, so that's a sagittal view to point out uh, the sinuses. All right, the last bone of the skull before we do the vertebral column is the mandible. Uh, we'll start at the top over here. The mandibular condyle articulates with the mandibular fossa of the temporal bone. What do we call that? The condyle of the mandible in the mandibular fossa. What is that? We talked about it already. And when we said we talked about the temporal bone, what did we say about this? What is this? TMJ. TMJ. This is the temporal mandibular joint, right? This process we also talked about, the coronoid. It's tricky, right? Don't get confused here. Don't make a mistake. In anatomy, most of the time, I don't really care when students are writing things as long as they get close, but you can't make this mistake. If that's a C and that's an A, so I pronounced it coracoid instead of coronoid, where would I be? On the scapula. On the scapula. Who said that? Tommy, you said that? Yeah, I'd be on the scapula. So is there another coronoid like this one? On the ulna. On the ulna, yeah. So coronoid process. Now, what did you learn about the coronoid process when we talked about it before? It does. The zygomatic arch. It goes deep to the zygomatic arch, right? What is the name of that muscle? It's attached to the temporal bone. It's temporalis. Temporalis. temporalis, yeah, attaches to the coronoid, exactly. Very important muscle for mastication, for chewing. Okay, and then there's a ramus here. This is the upward superior extension of the body of the mandible, called the ramus, and an angle, the angle of the ramus, and then we have the body. And then on the lateral side, there's a mental foramen, through which nerves pass to help control the muscles of the chin. Um, and it's sensory, it's mostly sensory stuff there. And then on the other side, on the inside, on the medial border of the ramus is a hole called the mandibular foramen. Branches of the alveolar nerves come out there. I, don't, I will ask you the nerve stuff here just to be aware of the names of the holes that are found in the mandible. Mandibular and mental in their locations. Coronoid. Mandibular condyle, ramus, and body. Now, the only other thing to say about this is what we said about the maxilla earlier, and it houses teeth. And so there are, in the adult mouth, there are 16 teeth associated with the mandible, 16 associated with the maxilla in the adult mouth. Lots more to come on teeth in the spring. All right, let's
Let's talk about the vertebral column. One of the things that surprises students about the vertebral column is its curvatures. So you think because you were tested in elementary school for abnormal curvature of your spine, that the spine is supposed to be straight. But that's not true. In fact, a normal vertebral column has significant curvatures. Starting from the top, there's a cervical curve that projects anteriorly, a thoracic curve that projects dorsal or posteriorly, a lumbar curve that projects anteriorly, and a sacral curve that projects posteriorly. Now, I told you about this before. In the slide where we talked about the fibrocartilage pads between the vertebral bones, I told you that we would bring this up again when we looked at the vertebral column. Okay, so the majority of the body weight, if you remember, is projected onto the first sacral bone, S1, the sacral promontory. And so all of this upper torso body weight is impinging here. A couple of things that point this out, right? The first one that jumps out at you is the size of the bodies of the lumbar bones. They're huge. They are designed for weight support. They are massive bones. But the lumbar curve itself tells you something else. This can in fact cause problems with individuals. And most of the time the problems are here in the disc between L4 and L5 and L5 and S1. And you can see why, because this curve where is, where would you expect the damage to occur here normally? Front or back? Back. Okay, so all the weight is pressing down on this and the curve is anterior. Where's the annulus gonna be most susceptible to damage? On this side, right? I'm pressing forward on this thing. And so oftentimes these injuries are here and then they press on the spinal nerves and you get pain in there. Um, the annulus of the nucleus pulposus, damage in L4 to L5, it, it's the curve of the lumbar really points this out. Now, there are in fact clinical conditions for abnormal curves, and you know some of them. For example, you were all tested, I'm sure, in elementary school for scoliosis. Scoliosis is by definition an abnormal lateral curve. So are these lateral curves? No, these are anterior, these are anterior and posterior curves. They're normal. It is not normal, see? This is a dorsal view. It is not normal for the curve to be lateral. So that can cause problems and can be dealt with surgically. So you were tested for that. There are also problems where these curves are exaggerated and most students come to me not knowing about these. The two most common are a dorsally exaggerated thoracic curve, that's this, a dorsally exaggerated thoracic curve. That is a condition called lordosis. Good, who said that? Lordosis, well done. This is lordosis. Or a less common condition that looks more like this. That is an anteriorly exaggerated lumbar curve. Kyphosis. Kyphosis, well done. Lordosis and kyphosis. A lordosis is a dorsally exaggerated thoracic and uh, kyphosis for dorsally exaggerated uh, lumbar curve. Good. So scoliosis, lordosis, and kyphosis, um, unusual curves, exaggerated from the normal, and scoliosis for the lateral. Dr. Warren, yes. it's not letting me see you. It doesn't like the power supply, I'm afraid. So how much do we get? Uh, I have the whole thing. What? I have the whole thing. You have it? Mm -hmm. I'm recording right now. You want to put your phone in here? Or I can. can. you get it from there? I can. You can bring it by later? Mm -hmm. That's my girl. Okay. <laughs> All right. So uh, let's talk about the bones individually. This is a thoracic bone. We're going to do this twice. We'll do this thoracic bone twice. I use it the first time to talk about the pieces and parts of the bone. Okay, so we'll start on the right and work our way left. The body of the bone is on the anterior side of the bone. Okay. And what do we know about the bodies as they transition from cervical to thoracic to lumbar? They get, they get bigger, yeah. So in fact, there's really no body on C1, is there? There's nothing there. It's just an anterior arch. And there's really no body per se on C2. 
There's just a process that sits off of it. C3 is a little tiny one, and then they gradually get bigger as you work through the cervical and thoracic bones, and the lumbars are the biggest. So the lumbar bones are largest. That's one way of telling uh, the bones. All right, we work our way across here. You can see the next label up on top here is the superior articulating facet, or the facet, or the superior articulating process. Okay, so every bone, every vertebral bone has both a superior and an inferior articulating process or facet, right? Which direction do the superior facets face? Anterior. Which direction do the superior facets face? I see here we facet and face, I'm doing that on purpose. Which direction do they face? <laughs> the superior facets face this way. So the superior facet of the atlas faces the occipital condyle, right? The first cervical bone faces up. It faces superior toward the occipital bone. The inferior articular facet faces inferior. So C1 faces C2 inferior. Now, is that true all the way down the vertebral column? No. It is not true. Tell me what's different. How do they change? Who said no? Did you say no? You said no. Okay, why not? Well, how do they change? <laughs> you guessed? You made that up? You thought it was a rhetorical question? <laughs> What's that? I did. Okay, so I gave it away. Right, so the answer to the sarcasm in my voice was obviously no. Okay, right, so they don't. You know why? You know how? Some will face laterally so they can connect with real. Okay. So that's not right, but you're, you're onto something here, right? So the ribs do not articulate with these facets. The ribs articulate on the transverse processes in the bodies. So the heads go to the bodies for two bones. What happened? She's not supposed to be done yet. So um, what was I saying? Yeah. The transverse processes in bodies, those are for the ribs on the thoracic bones. Okay, so they don't articulate with the superior and inferior facets. Okay. Something to do with the fibrocartilage? No. It's another good guess. Okay, so let's just cut to the chase, right? As you move down the vertebral column, this joint between the superior and inferior facets is a joint at each bone. They're called the zygopophyseal joints as you move down the vertebral column. And they have different abilities for motion as you move down the vertebral column. So if you fit this facet with the one on top of it and the one below in a flat surface superior to inferior, you can see that that would allow for some lateral movement in this joint. It's a synovial joint, right? So the most flexibility that we have is caused by the zygopophyseal joints of the superior and inferior facets in my neck and in the areas where the ribs are. So I have the most lateral bending and things. These zyg zygopophyseal joints in the cervical and lumbar areas sit expectedly superior and inferior in their articulation. But when you move to the lumbar areas, thank you, Dr. Elliott. When you move to the lumbar areas of the vertebral column, do you want, what is the design here for the lumbar region? Do you want a lot of, do you want a lot of movement with the side? You don't want them up. These are places where you want support, right? Weight bearing bones. You're not looking for mobility in the lumbar area. So look carefully next time you're in the lab at the superior and inferior facets in the lumbar area because they don't sit like this. They're angled like this, so as to prevent any kind of medial and lateral motion in that joint. They are designed for stability. You don't give the same kind of motion there. And you can see it in the anatomy. If you look at them, you will see how the angles change in the lumbar area. 
They're actually called superior and inferior facets, but they articulate medial and lateral. So you don't get that motion. Okay, so that's your facets there, superior and inferior articulating facets. Now, between each bone, because of the articulation of these facets, there is formed here, because of the orientation of the pedicles in the spinous processes, a notch, a hole here called the intervertebral notch. What is in that notch? In our, what? No. 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 This is where the spinal nerves exit the cord. This is where the spinal nerves come out of the cord. So in this picture, all these notches are going to be, you can't see them well here, but they're coming out this side, and you'll have all of the spinal nerves exiting. 31 pairs of them come out of these notches, these, what are called these intervertebral notches. Now the spinal cord itself is in here. This is the vertebral foramen. So there's the body, there's your superior facet or facet, and your cord is in here. Now you see how you can't see the notch here? This is the notch here. But in order to really see, you gotta turn the thing on its side to see how they articulate with each other, to see that intervertebral notch. So, what's in the vertebral foramen? The spinal cord. What's in the intervertebral notch? The spinal nerves. Yeah, leaving the spinal cord. Okay, and then let's build the house that the spinal cord is in. So certainly the foundation of the house, the base, this is the anterior side, is the body. The walls, the side walls of the vertebral column are called pedicles. And the roofs, the roofs of the vertebral bones are called lamina. Now, this is a, a relatively common procedure, a relatively common back procedure to relieve pressure on vertebral uh, columns that have been damaged, uh, all kinds of different clinical things that I don't know about. Uh, but I've done one. Actually, I've done many of these on cadavers. I don't know how a surgeon does them on a real person. But the procedure is said to be a laminectomy in which some kind of device is used to relieve pressure on the spinal cord by breaking the lamina. So which direction would you come into the spinal cord in order to get to the lamina? From the back or the front? The back. From the back. Does everybody see that? This is the dorsal. This is the back side. This is the front side. So a laminectomy is breaking the lamina. So I don't know. I think it depends on where they are in the cord, but I think most of the time they'll break off a piece of the lamina and leave the spinous process, but I'm not sure how that, how, that, how that plays out in time. We'd have to talk to a neurosurgeon about that because if you break the lamina at that point, normally the spinous process is not gonna have any support on it. And of course, as you know, the muscles along the back have attachments to these spinous processes. So that's a serious matter. I don't really know how that's done surgically. But when I'm teaching kids about spinal cord anatomy in the cadaver lab, I have them do laminectomies. So they remove the musculature of the back and we always do it around L4, L2 to L4, because the spinal cord ends there and you can see where the cord ends and the nerves come out. It's a really good location. And I have them start, find L4 and work your way up a couple and start busting lamina. In order to do this, y'all, these bones are so strong, these lumbar bones. In the gross anatomy labs, they have chisels, like the big macho chisels that you can buy at Lowe's, and ball peen hammers in their toolbox. And so once, once the musculature is removed and you can see the spinous process, then uh, you can take you know, one of your little lab tools and try to cut the bone and stuff. That will not do it. So it's my goal one day to watch a neurosurgeon do this. I don't know how you can break this thing without damaging the cord because every time we hit it, once you get through it, you're always gonna impinge on the cord. And y'all, if you touch the spinal cord, you got major problems. So every part of it has very important information in it. You don't wanna to be touching it. So how are you gonna break that thing? So we have to, in order to break it, we have to, you know, one of these actions. 
like that to break that bone. They're very strong, these lamina. Okay, so lamina, pedicles, bodies, spinous processes, and finally, we're getting to your thing here, the transverse processes here. You can see these things have facets on them as well. So the transverse processes have facets on them, and look, you see that? That bone right there has a facet on its body. So I knew, before I looked at the label, I knew if it's got a facet on its body, it's a thoracic bone because the tubercles of the ribs articulate with the transverse processes and the heads articulate with the bodies. Now, the body um, articulation is even more interesting. Have any of you noticed this? So all 12 thoracic bones have these facets on them right here on the bodies. But if you look carefully at them, you will see that each one of them is really a half facet. It's not a whole facet. And so the heads of the ribs fit on the bones between the bones. So the, so the intervertebral discs have got to be thinner there, which we do know to be a fact. So very interesting articulation here, heads of the ribs, tubercles of the ribs articulating with the bodies and the transverse processes here. All right.